And thanks everyone for coming. I uh, hope you find this fun. Uh, my name is Eduardo, as you said. I work at Meta on uh, a lot of our open mapping initiatives. We use open map data to build our, our maps. You might have seen some of our presentations over the last few days. And I want to talk to you about AR, augmented reality, and why it's important uh, for the open data community and how it relates to maps. So, um, yeah, hello to the people tuning in from the future as well online. Uh, good to have you here as well. Just a bit of like overall context, Meta uses maps and geospatial data and a lot of people come up to us like over the last few days as well, it's a common question, does Meta have maps? Like I don't see a, a mapping application like Google has, how to use map data. And so if you didn't see the B2B presentation, we use it in things like Facebook pages. Uh, location is important to have there. Instagram discovery, you're starting to see when you search in Instagram for different things now, maps are coming up um, more often if you're searching for a geospatial uh, related term. Recommendations, which people use on Facebook. And then what I'm really excited about is the AR side of things and the virtual reality in XR, which is what we're going to talk about today. And that's kind of the, the future of maps that we're building towards and just a quick recap of some of the ways we work with the open data community. We have three big projects that we talk about. Um, we have Maplery, which is a street level imagery platform, which is particularly important when we're thinking about augmented reality. We have the OpenStreetMap editor Rapid, which uses AI and, and also takes open data sets from places like government uh, and incorporates them into OpenStreetMap. It's, it's open source. Anyone can, can go and contribute to OpenStreetMap with that. And then Overture Maps, which takes a lot of um, open data sources from various places, curates them and makes them fit for purpose. So whether you're trying to build a navigation application on top of open data, or you're trying to, you're like meta, powering some of the use cases I mentioned before, that's where uh, Overture Maps comes into support. So the message today is that AR is, is coming. It's, and I think it's very analog analogous to self-driving cars, which uh, I think many people feel will come eventually, but it's a very hard technical challenge and the question, um, is, is when, when are they going to come and, and obviously the date gets, keeps getting pushed back but the pieces are being, of the puzzle are being put together and so AR is analogous in the sense that it's a very hard mapping challenge but I think it's going to happen slowly and slowly and then overnight all of a sudden it'll be a, a central computing platform that all of us are using every day in the same way that no one was really talking about generative AI 18 months ago and now everyone's talking about a lot of people are using it but the, the groundwork was being laid over many, many years. So just for those that maybe are less familiar with the term, augmented reality AR is just a, a way of saying digital information overlaid on the physical world. And when you think about that, it's, it's incredibly exciting. Imagine all the information that we know about the world around us that we currently have in a digital space overlaid onto the real world. There's so many different things that you could do. We'll touch on some of them. Um, but the possibilities are endless, particularly when you think about the form factors of the devices that are, that are accessing that information. There are so many possibilities, but again, they're dependent on, on the devices that are, that are producing that experience and the underlying map data. Another question that comes up a lot around AR is, is it hyped? There's a lot of these technological phenomenons that get, get really hyped up and then they fizzle out. Some people could say AR is that. Um, I, I don't believe it is. I think when we start to see really practical use cases of it um, that really makes a meaningful improvement to people's lives, it's inevitable that it's going to stick around. And I think that was the challenge with some other technologies like Web3, crypto, where they were really struggling to connect it to people's everyday lives outside of maybe some uh, developing countries that didn't have good financial infrastructure. But I think AI solves a lot of real world challenges. And this is true even going back to 2010, I was a student, I just got my first iPhone and there was an app called Urban Spoon which uh, apparently is not very popular in the United States but what about here in Europe? Did anyone use Urban Spoon? No. no I seem to be the only one, the only one that knows about this app but uh, it was awesome. You would select your restaurant, you select the, the cuisine, the dollar signs, like how much you wanted to spend and you could lock all of them or none of them and shake it and it would tell you what's around you. But even back then, it would have this camera viewfinder where it would show you the restaurants just using the GPS location. So there's you know, nothing fancier than that going on behind the scenes. But it was really cool as a student new to this city to hold up the camera and just be able to see restaurants around me. So even back in 2010, AR 
had a very practical use case for me. Fast forward to today, and I think it's, it's starting to creep in, but it's not super prevalent. Um, hands up if you've ever used AR in a shopping capacity to buy something. Okay, so maybe like four people. Um, and someone volunteer, like tell me, tell me your, how you found the experience. I was like surprised that it worked as well as it did. How did you use it? Like what was the use case? I, I think it was like um, something, I can't remember, it's either off Amazon right here or something, and it was like, um, I think maybe it was uh, like some drawers for like stationery and I wanted to see how big it would be on my desk. Yeah. So, like, Yeah, that's a similar use case for me, I think, that I had in mind. I bought my desk and it's very useful for, uh, for just being able to position it without actually needing to measure anything. And that's just all using um, the phone's camera, of course, to, to take measurements of the room. So, T-shirt, large, is that suitable? Uh, probably medium. Okay. All right. <laughs> Another use case is facial filters, which is a lot of fun. Um, it's not really like super life changing. Uh, maybe it makes you prettier or scarier, but uh, this is probably the most commonly used example of AR around the world. And so when you think of AR, there's a lot of, especially at Meta, the way like the AR uh, SDK that we have, you can build it based around someone's face or you can make it world locked where it's based on the, on, on, the, on the physical properties of the world around. So those two s seem to be the two ways in which it's being implemented. Either you're locking to a person or to the world itself. Face filters are cool, but you know, for phosphor I don't think it's as exciting as some of the other potential use cases. One that starts to intersect with mapping is gaming. Uh, hands up if you play Pokemon Go. Everyone, okay, who wants to tell me about um, how do you think maps are important to Pokemon Go? I thought that's how you get around. So I didn't play Pokemon Go, I played the Nerdier version, where you have a blue team and a green team. I don't know what, it, what it's called, but I had a lot of fun and I explored my area, got to know everything about it. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the name. Um, what was the name? That was Niantic's first game. Ingress. Right? Uh, Ingress. Ingress, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, so I can't speak for Ingress, but uh, for Pokemon Go, they use OpenStreetMap data, or at least they used to, and, and things like water bodies were important. Where is water? And then they would generate water Pokemon. I don't know what the logic was to generate other types of Pokemon, but um, that was one aspect of map data. But then the other really interesting thing is every time you're using Pokemon Go, Niantic is, is getting map data to help map the world around, and then they can obviously use that to they have a, an SDK that developers can use to build upon um, the map data that they've collected and create other augmented reality experiences. And then they have this new game called Peridot, which is a bit like Tamagotchi, if you ever had a Tamagotchi pet. And that is, uh, I tried to play it, you can kind of throw this ball at this little ugly creature, and he chases it. And this was just in my hotel room, he like, it just maps in real time. Um, and so it gets a sense of your surroundings, which is pretty cool. Sorry, I forgot to give you a t-shirt up the back there for your answer before. Large? Uh, medium. <laughs> Alright, that's a large medium. Try not to hit anyone. Thanks. Good cash. Alright, navigation. This is where it starts to get exciting. And Google is really um, at the forefront here. They've implemented VPS in quite a few cities around the world. And they're using Google Street View um, to help achieve this. So, You've all heard of GPS using satellites to locate. In downtown urban areas where there's a lot of buildings, it's quite hard to, to locate. And that's where VPS, visual positioning systems, can come in handy. And the, the phone can know that you're in this area because it's using the camera to see that the points of the building that you're looking at align with their, their pre-computed knowledge from Google Street View. Um, so it can call that API and say, you're standing just outside the Empire State Building, you're looking in this direction, and that can augment the compass and GPS and Wi-Fi positioning systems. And then they can overlay very accurate navigation um, information. So give pedestrians a, a sense of where they're going without having to um, constantly scan around the map. 
So that was, that was the current experiences. And now, now we're going to the future. Imagine you're waiting for a ride, you're waiting for an Uber or a taxi to this venue. I think the bus driver would love to know where you are. The, the taxi driver would love to know where you are and you'd love to know where they are. And this is where you can imagine if you're wearing a different form factor um, and, and able to see AR through you know, potentially glasses or through um, even your phone being able to hold it up and see what's, what's around you. You can see how far the bus is um, and, and they could see exactly where you are with a similar sort of experience. Another thing that I would love, navigating by bicycle. This is always a, a navigational challenge. You either have to kind of mount the phone to your bicycle at the moment or you have to stop and check where you are or hold your hand and with one, one hand hold the phone and the other hand hold the bicycle. And AR would be super helpful here if you didn't even have to hold anything, you could see where you're going and all the points are just overlaid onto the real world. And actually James at the back was showing me a really cool uh, indoor navigation example that he worked on previously where you could drop almost like Pac-Man uh, pins in the supermarket and do indoor navigation using AR. So that's a, yet another example. You can imagine going to the Roman Colosseum or walking around the fortress in prison and rather than having to get out an old map or looking at the very like out of date signs that were peeling in the sun at the top of the fortress, you'd be able to, with your phone, just hold it up, see what the fortress used to look like in its heyday and, and then just kind of alternate between that digital, digital overlay and that, that the real world in front of you, which is really cool. And the thing that I guess I'm most excited about is pedestrian navigation. I think cars have driven the, the future of mapping for, um, well, they've kind of been behind a lot of mapping for the last 30 years. A lot of the big mapping companies here, TomTom, Tom, um, they were servicing automotive companies. Google, like in its early days, was servicing the automotive sector, how you get from A to B in a car. And the underserved market has been pedestrian mapping, particularly in a city like Prizren, which has these like really nice um, walkable streets that are a lot harder for mapping companies to map. This is where um, we could do a better job as an open source community is, is creating good open map data, where the sidewalks are, what the gradient is, um, and so on. But of course, cars have potential for AR as well. Um, AR enabled windshields, I think are pretty crazy and pretty cool. So this is something the BMW is planning to release in the next couple of years, which is a, an overlay on, on their vehicle, which can start to show you things like where your next turn is. And you can think of it as a step up from a heads up display that some people have in their cars now. And then going a step beyond that, there's companies like Volvo and Harman that are looking at having a windshield that's almost completely a display, but obviously like interspersing the real world as well, so you know where you're going. And you could start to overlay things like um, the speed limit or that there's a, an animal up ahead that could be dangerous, um, also giving you indication of where turns are coming up which makes it much safer for the driver because they don't need to look down at a map or uh, get distracted looking at their phone. Eventually, of course, this will all be replaced with self-driving cars, which was the analogy at the start. So why does this matter for OpenStreetMap and why does it matter for the Phosphor G community? I think we want to make sure that our maps are useful. We want to make sure that the things that we're doing are useful, um, that we're not just building map data that, that sits in isolation somewhere. So as the famous Abraham Lincoln said many years ago, maybe um, if a map falls in the forest, is it still a map? And the answer is of course it is. Um, we want to have maps that uh, are useful, that people are actually able to consume. And so these use cases that I talked about that are coming, we want to make sure that we, we have map data that's there and, and able to power them. So what do we actually need to do that? It looks like none of my emojis here are working, but um, we, we want things like addresses. We want things like sidewalk data, surface type. Uh, you can imagine if, if you're navigating in prison as a, using AR, you want street lights, you want places. Um, you need to know that, what the destination is. Places data in OpenStreetMap right now is really poor. So we're, we're looking at ways, how can we collectively as a community improve our knowledge of, of points of interest. Saeed up the back had a really good tweet today though that showed um, organic maps, which is based off OpenStreetMap data compared to, uh, I think it was Apple Maps it might have been. Was that right, Saeed? Yeah, Apple Maps versus 
Apple Maps has nothing in Prisren, um, but OpenStreetMap has a lot of point of, interest, point of interest data. So kudos to the open source community here. Other things that we need for pedestrian navigation, we need things like the, the ways. Um, this is the actual routes that you can navigate on. Most of OpenStreetMap does not have uh, a, a great data set of ways. Um, in Prisbane, I had a look, it's, it's, it's okay, but we can do better to map out all the ways. Crosswalks are really important, just like a car routing um, weights, different things like traffic lights and, and um, stop signs to work out how long it takes to get from A to B. Crossings are really important for pedestrians. Where can I cross safely? Um, what, is the, what is the actual route? Obviously, you don't want to cross, get someone with AR to cross the middle of a six lane highway. Um, and so we're trying to map out this using uh, a lot of our open collaborations with different uh, governments and companies around the world. And then, as I said, points of interest are one of the most important things as well to get from A to B. So, um, in OpenStreetMap, they're re represented by areas in some cases. So, the building is mapped out, and, and we have POI data. Sometimes it's a point. Um, and so, we're trying to create more standardization there and make sure it's up to date and that a lot of the legacy data is, is deleted. There's a, often in OpenStreetMap, people add stuff and then it doesn't get cleaned up. Uh, nice to have, we have obviously 3D building data is really interesting for occlusion. So if you can imagine if you're uh, in New York City or uh, maybe a European example would be, Europe doesn't have any tall buildings, maybe Moscow or like parts of Milan have some really tall buildings. You'd want occlusion, which is where the building is, um, is, is known, like we, we have the 3D representation of the building, and so we're not placing AR effects inside it, or we're not placing them behind it. Um, or if, let, let's say there's a building, and you wanna make sure that there's a, a pin at the entrance of the building, we, we know like the 3D outline of that building, and we can place the pin right at that entrance. So 3D buildings is super helpful for many things. Um, and then perhaps the most important technology of all and the one that we're all helping to contribute to is VPS. This was something I mentioned at the start, which is how if you're using your phone in, in maybe the future to work out where you are or potentially glasses that, that might become more common, um, you have a 3D representation of the world around you and those glasses can work out where they are. And so this is an example from uh, Pittsburgh airport where Meta was doing some collection with ARIA. This is a, a project that you can read about online if you just Google ARIA. But these glasses collect data and with those glasses you can um, build a 3D representation of this case, an airport. And then they were testing that with someone who's blind and, and then they could um, have audio, audio uh, import to know where they should go. So the glasses knew the environment and they could localize on the fly and the audio um, that that lady who was blind was receiving helped her get throughout the airport um, and obviously with the assistance of a, a guide dog as well. So VPS, um, we're, we're kind of looking at it through the lens of Mapillary, which is a street level imagery platform. People upload <coughs> photos using 360 cameras and smartphones and every image that's uploaded, we process it to create this point cloud and we position objects that are interesting for, for mapping like traffic signs and bicycle parking and, and sidewalks. But the underlying point cloud itself is really interesting. So like even today I had someone come up and he was asking like the, the meta team, can I create VPS using Mapillary data? Well, through the API, he can download point clouds and start to build um, experiences in, in the app that he's building to be able to localize in a particular area. And so the more 360 imagery we have, the more like high quality imagery we have, the better we are able to create these BPS experiences. Why does, what, what's this all gonna look like? What's the kind of end output? You can imagine something like this, someone walking um, outside their home, they have the keys displayed on the table there, they're going to this Vietnamese restaurant and overlaid over the Vietnamese restaurant is potentially the fact that it was recommended by their friends, it might be the review, they might get the exact location, the waiting time, there's so much digital information that we can overlay into the world around us. But to be able to do that, we need to know where we are with high, a high degree of precision. 
And so open map data is going to be critical. If we, if we use closed data sources, we miss out on the diversity of the world. We miss out on, on powering a lot of the potential experiences that we might not think about um, if we're thinking in isolation with just proprietary data sources. So at Meta, we're really excited about um, using open data. We use it a lot at the moment. We contribute in various ways um, through the tools that I mentioned. And so if you're interested to follow more about what we're doing in the open map data space, please, uh, you can follow us on Twitter. You can follow us um, on, on Facebook groups as well. We have MapLory group. We have a, a rapid editor group. And then we have this mapsatmeta.com website. So I'll wrap it up there. Thank you, Kosovo, for putting on this great event. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, fire away.